AFC podcast. My name is Victoria Fragnito. Just so you know, you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, on Google Podcasts, on CastBox. You can also see our beautiful faces on YouTube. I'm joined by my co-host, Jim. Say hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. Oh, we're back at... a while since we did that. Uh, It's been like 10 episodes since we did that, and I didn't miss it at all. But I'm guys, <laughs> thank you for tuning in to the AFC podcast, everyone. We're gonna have a fun podcast today. We're joined by our day player, Giuseppe Bosilio. He is an actor, a dancer, a singer, he's a musician. He's now also behind the camera. He's done quite a bit. I worked on him, uh, worked with him on a film called Ode to Passion. We're gonna show up that trailer a little later. Ode to Passion is a musical movie. Uh which is rare, and that also, not only is it a musical, but the written, the spoken words are all spoken in verse, which is, I don't think it's been done. I think that's a new thing. I've never heard of a musical that is also spoken in verse. You, you've heard of musicals, but not both. And it's a crazy, weird mixture, but I feel like it works. I think it works. And I might only- it's, it's definitely- producer, But, you know- <laughs> I, d- I think that it's definitely, that's definitely a, a tough thing to tackle. So, you know, yeah. good on you guys for trying to do something different. Anytime you're trying to jump from one medium to another, it's tricky because if you have a musical and you're trying to make a movie out of that musical, uh, it's, it's tough because you want to, you want to make it new and you want to make it interesting. Uh, and I mean, this, this goes for most, I'm saying this on behalf of like most things that are like established musicals. But, you know, if you want to make a movie for it, there's the desire to adapt it to a movie form. Mm -hmm. Um, Ode to Passion has this cool, unique perspective of, like, it never was, like, a stage musical. It's always meant for a movie. Um, So it's interesting. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a tricky thing to try to do a weird mix of both. Um, Yeah, I mean, I... You know, movie musicals are, they go back for as long as, you know, you you were able to have sound with films. Like that's, you know, a thing that was most of what they did up through the through the 50s, essentially, was a lot of, you know, movie musicals. Um, and then that went away for a really long time. And it didn't, you know, they, they had some here and there, but it didn't really come back full force until they did Chicago um in what 2003 ish i want to say um and now you know every other movie that comes out is a movie musical but i after watching movies that they turn into musicals that you're like why would you do this why would you make rocky into a musical why (laughs) well i mean then there's some that really work like all the disney ones those really work i mean i actually i had this discussion this morning um talking about how like, you know, Disney really nailed it when they did like Lion King, cause that was so unique. And, you know, I think that's, that shows the magic of theater in it, that you took this animated film about animals and you put it on stage using, you know, puppetry and dance and all of this stuff to make it work. And then after a while, like, while I'm always, I feel like a movie being turned into a musical always works better than a musical being turned into a movie. I feel like you lose that magic a little bit. I think after a while, Disney got just got formulaic with it and they just kept turning them out and turning them out and turning them out. And, you know, I don't think all of them are necessary. The benefit of the Disney movies is that they're already making songs. It's already a musical kind of. uh, Well, I think that was like what people thought about Frozen. Like they thought this, they made this, for the sole intent that they know it's going, they're going to turn it into a Broadway musical. They want that to be the next musical. They want to do all of that with it, which they did. Unfortunately, COVID ended that run um, yeah. permanently. But I mean, I don't know. I didn't think it was really necessary. But you know, it still it lost jobs for people, which sucks. Yeah, I mean, no matter what, I mean, Broadway is kind of screwed right now. Um, we're going to talk to Giuseppe about that a little bit, I'm sure. But uh, Hamilton is doing something that's a little unique and filming their Broadway show and putting it out on Disney Plus, which is really cool. But, but honestly, though, it's not that unique. There's actually a, a streaming site called Theater HD where you can watch. They always, they, I think 
almost always, at least for archives or something like that, they will film shows. Um, so on Theater HD, you can watch, you know, classic Broadway shows with the original cast, like the original Sunday in the Park with George with Mandy Patinkin and Bernadette Peters, you can watch on there. So like, while, um, you know, this is awesome that they filmed Hamilton, it's not necessarily a new thing, but I think, it's new to you. This is great you. because now I'm like, cool, I'm gonna watch some Broadway shows later. <laughs> yeah, seriously. But, um, you know, I think it's brilliant that they did it with Hamilton. One, because like, it's definitely, it, it broke barriers down for a lot of people, especially, you know, people of color. And with how ridiculous the ticket prices are, there are people who just, that should be seeing it that can't. Yeah. Um, I had so this that had tickets to go see it, and then obviously that's out the window because of COVID. But I mean, tickets are astronomical. Like it's ridiculous. It's not accessible to people, and it should be. So like, I really hope that this. Is... I think this question now is now that you can just watch it on Disney Plus, is it worth that massive of a ticket price to see it live and in person? You know, I I personally feel like it is. Because it's I mean, the energy is missing when you watch them, yeah. plus. but at the same yeah. time, like I, I, I think it's worthy to spend the money. But how much money? I mean, I don't. I honestly don't think that theater should ever cost as much as someone's rent costs. Like I don't care where the the seat is. Like I just don't think it. Theater is meant to be enjoyed by the masses it's meant it's you know it's storytelling art it's a way that we connect with each other you know and if you make it only so that certain audiences can see it then what's the point i just don't think there's a point in it so the i i think would be like harry potter and the cursed child because it's like two shows it's back to back two full three or four hour productions right but still two productions should not cost my rent yeah Going to see two shows should not cost my rent. I, sh I live in New York City and I'm not, you know, destitute. I should be able to afford to go see shows more than I did before all of this happened. And, you know, there are certain shows that I just resigned to the fact that because of who was in it and because of, you know, the hype around it that I just wasn't going to be able to get to see. And Hamilton, Hamilton was definitely one of them. I was like, I'm never seeing this live. That's not happening unless I win the Hamilton lottery. That's just not happening. Yeah. Um, so like, I'm really glad like they filmed the original Broadway cast. I think it, you know, it was, it was brilliant. Um, but I'm really interested to see how Giuseppe's actually doing with the whole shutdown um, and, and what's going to happen with them coming back, where they're at, mm -hmm. all of that. He is this big Broadway actor and he chose of all movies, Scarface as his movie choice. Yeah. So without further ado, let's let's talk to Giuseppe about his movie choice, Scarface, and let's show the trailer to Ode to Passion. How about Michael? How's he doing? He's in love. He's in love. He's wooing. Yes. He stopped by today, dropped off my book. I could tell right away he had that uh, strange look. You mean the one where he looks right through you, floating in space in his lovely love bubble? <laughs> That's the one. I think we're in trouble. Yeah, it'll be fine. Not this time. She's a dream, John. She's a dream. Love like this, this day and age, is rarely ever seen. It's this passion, this fever within you that rages, ignoring all the wisdom handed down throughout the ages. You've known me since I was younger. To find true love has been like a hunger. Don't interpret God's teachings to do as you choose. You can't will her to change. You only lose. Passion, passion, fires are burning deep inside. Feel the yearning to win for love, for you, for me, for love, for truth.
All right, we are here with Giuseppe Bosilio. I'm saying that right, right? Yeah, you, you nailed it. I nailed it, of course I did. I've known you for years, man. It's yeah, good man. to be up with you. How you been? I've been good, man. I've been good. Uh, just chilling in this uh, time of quarantine. Been trying to been trying to stay mentally sane by uh, gardening and walking my dogs and and yeah, not not taking life too seriously. You know, I've been working since I was 11 years old, so finally now I have like really it, I'm forced to take a break. Um, so finally I'm doing it and just taking it easy. That's for the best. I gotta say, you look a little different than in the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're right, man. I, I don't, I don't have that baby face no more. No. Uh, so, uh, what, what have you been working on recently? Have you been doing anything during quarantine or are you kind of just like taking it that easy? So, um, been- so, so actually for the first three months, I was really taking it literally that easy. Um, I hadn't moved the muscle. I, I would get up in the morning and just relax, go water my plants, walk the dogs, play video games, and then go back to sleep. And it was nighttime. Like, you know, it was literally that hard of it, taking it easy. Yeah. Um, but now finally, I'm, I, I finally feel like I'm waking up out of my slumber, out of my hibernation. Um, and I'm, I've been working a lot on um, videography and filmography and, and just filming a lot of dance specifically i've been working on this um uh thing called dancer talks uh, my girlfriend founded it and it's just you know a platform for all dancers to to get together and share stories and know about them and what's really cool about it, it and which gives me a lot of practice is that i've been cutting together these like 30 45 second clips of all of these dancers we're interviewing <clears throat> and if they're not dancers um, I get to like film whatever it is that they do. So <clears throat> because it's anything related to dance, um, we're going to be interviewing like physical therapists and stuff like that. Um, and it's really cool to like play with, oh, how can I capture this and how can I make this uh, look awesome and epic? And um, I've been doing a lot of research on like Daniel Schiffer B-roll on YouTube and Peter McKinnon, you know, all that YouTube stuff. Uh, and it's been really fun to like, play around with transitions and I think you know it's it's starting to look better and better I think yeah I I think it was like a whole year after we finished shooting Ode to Passion or at the time it was Festivals of Patience yep (laughs) a whole year after that that you hit me up and you were like hey uh how do you use cameras and I was like uh that's tough man I mean happy to help uh but then you got into it now you're doing it more that's really cool yeah, it's, it's really fun. Um, I actually took your guys' advice. You guys were talking about like GH5s and G, you know, G, GH4. Um, I ended up getting the GH5, uh, which I, I didn't know has a very, very cropped sensor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you literally get half the image, which is a little annoying. That's um, a four, four thirds camera. That's any other yeah. four thirds camera, but. Uh, it, that's that's the thing is you kind of have to pay more money for the full frame sensor. Right, right. Uh, and I think that's going to be my next investment is probably going to be like something like Sony A7 III. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. All of this sounds like gibberish to me. I have no <laughs> idea what you guys are talking about. I'm just sitting here nodding along like I know. <laughs> well, well, this is the beautiful thing is that we, we, when we started the podcast, it was like, cool, I'm the camera person. I'm behind the camera. Victoria is the actor. And she does all the theater stuff. And she's like the opposite end of the spectrum. And then Giuseppe comes in here and he's like this weird <laughs> of the both. <laughs> awesome. And the connecting bridge. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, was that something that like always interests you? Like doing the behind the scenes stuff and you just never with how busy and, and frequently you work, which is awesome. You just didn't have time to really get to it or... You're, you're absolutely right. Um, it, it's all, it's always interested me. Um, I've, but it, it didn't really hit me until I was like 18, 19. Um, I'd, I'd like had a camera sitting in storage that I'd had from like when I was 16, it was a small Sony camera, the N5, I think. Um, <clears throat> but it ho- overheated a lot. So it, it overheated after like 50, 15 minutes of recording. So I was like, eh, I don't, I don't want to do it. This is really annoying. Um, and so finally, when I was 18, 19, I started getting together with a couple friends and I just shot like our gatherings and I was like, this is 
cool. This is like, this is dope. Um, and yeah, from then on, I just kept going and kept playing. That's a whole different creative muscle that you're playing. Yeah, completely, yeah. completely, bro. And the more, the more I do it, the more I realize how much power there is behind it, behind that side of the storytelling. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. uh, I always tell people, or I try to tell people, when, when they're like trying to get into it, I'm like, you're playing God because you're, you're in charge of everything people see and how they see yeah. it. So it's, it's kind of a weird thing. And especially once you get on the bigger levels of like creating your own sets, they start out with a completely black canvas, empty room. And then they, yeah. build, like, especially big sci-fi productions and things like that, where they're building spaceships and stuff. And yeah, they're sp- that's why people are so blown away by it is because George Lucas made up spaceships and like things you could be inside of. And like, it's, it's just, yeah. The imagination. Yeah. It, it's, it's almost like a, like you have this like house and you choose of where you want to put the window to let people see through. Yeah. There's stuff happening all around the house, but it's your choice of what you want to show people. It's, it's cool. It's awesome. My favorite people too, is that that's a great analogy, but you're also deciding where the sun is and how the yeah. light- Literally, it, it, you're literally playing God. You're absolutely right. Um, so uh, let, let's talk a little bit about Ode to Passion, because that's how we met years and years ago. Uh, this yeah. film has been long overdue. It's been slowly working its way into reality. Uh, Victoria was at the initial screening way back in the day, so she's seen it once yeah. a time. <laughs> uh, I think I saw... Uh, wait, you, yeah, you came to that screening. That that's the screening that I also, I also saw. It was really cool. Yeah. Um, I know for a fact that there have been a lot of re-edits and some changes made, and things are going to be mm-hmm. different. Uh, but we can say too that it's now. Uh, I mean, we're recording this in advance, but as as we're releasing this, it's now on Amazon Prime, so people can go check it out and watch it, see what the yeah. final product looks like. Uh, Ode to Passion on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's kind of cool having a movie come out to Amazon, you'd be like, oh, check out my movie. It's on Amazon. Yeah, literally. <laughs> um, it's got to be interesting, too, because you, I mean, you have a huge background in musical theater. Mm-hmm. So, and this had to be really interesting to work on a project that kind of fused two different things. You know, it was, it was yeah. film, and, you know, something completely different, but you still get to use, you know, that musical muscle, you know, yeah. while you're it was it was really really interesting. I mean, especially not only was it merged with with uh, film and musical theater, it was also merged with something completely. I mean, still all the same world, but poetry in a way and spoken words specifically. Um, that the whole entire script is is uh, spoken word or it's um First, what is it? Yeah. And pandemic, uh, what, what is it? What yeah. it? Was it perfect iambic pentameter? I think it was. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's why I was like, yo, this is crazy. This is amazing. I actually remember my audition, my audition for the movie. First off, I found this audition on, on backstage.com. Um, and when he sent me the sides, it was something completely different for me. And it was a scene from Faust. It was a scene from Faust that was also um, written like that. And I, I remember specifically, I was like, oh man, how do I, how do I read this? Like as an actor, truly, like, how do you read it and how do you make it sound the most natural possible? You know, Cause it's so Cause it, it's, it really is such an unnatural way of speaking. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you think so, but the more you do it, I'm a huge Shakespeare nerd and I work mm-hmm. with the Shakespeare company. So I, I feel like the more you do it, the more you realize that like iambic pentameter and verse is actually, and it's super nerdy, like to really like break it down and do all that stuff. So like, I, I feel like while we don't obviously speak in verse all the time, mm-hmm. there's, there is a, a natural, obviously flow to it that, that will help you out. But you know, it is kind of, it's weird when they put those things on film because you, you know, when you do it in Shakespeare in the Park and you've got that giant, you know, stage before you, you can overact and it can be big and, you know, this huge intense thing. But then when you're trying to speak intimately with somebody yeah. and, and you're using that, that's a completely different ballgame. 
And so that's actually exactly how I went into the audition room. <laughs> I literally just said, okay, this is for film. Okay, this is dynamic parameter. Well, let me just try to do it as real as I can. Mm -hmm. You know, let me, let me just really like just as simple and as straightforward as I can. And that's, I think what I ended up doing was my choices was just to keep it as simple as possible. And literally, I, I thought of it in the way that I completely just still am talking to you like I am now, but I just happen to talk in rhymes. <laughs> yeah. like living a dr seuss book but then also it literally a living dr seuss book yes yeah. uh, I, I remember the audition process and i remember the two major deciding factors because we had a bunch of people audition uh for the role of michael um obviously it's a love story too so the the combination of can this person speak in i can't even say what you guys have been saying but in rhymes <laughs> I am an pentameter or whatever that see that's <laughs> <laughs> this goes over my head. but can, can they speak and deliver the lines naturally so it sounds right uh can they sing and also the third thing was do girls like him and we literally showed to all the female like behind the scenes like casting and producer people that we were working with we showed all the clips to them and they were like we like him we, we really oh. like him. <laughs> As soon as you started singing, because everybody else sang and they were like, yeah, they have a really nice voice. They're a good singer. You started singing and they all just like melted. They were like, oh my God. Oh. <laughs> so I fell in love with you immediately. Um, and I think too, finding uh, Julia, who's amazing. Uh, she was a perfect matchup for you and you guys worked yeah. really well together. And yeah, uh, really cool. I think the film would have been very different had anyone else been casted in those roles. And for sure. For the, for the worst, you guys were the best choices we could have gotten, for sure. Um, what, was your, what was your favorite memory from working on that film? Oh, man. Um, there were so many. But I think it was just the experience of it. That's, like, my favorite memory. It was all the cra – because there was so much, like, crazy, unpredictable stuff that happened. Like, the weather being so cold yeah so cold and us having to like perform you know right near the brooklyn bridge in just a, a, a button down shirt or it was even worse for for julia i think because she had just literally a, a dress on yeah. and that's it dress in open toed shoes wearing a winter coat and pulling focus because i was the camera assistant yeah yeah i'm gonna be like i'm cold for you guys <laughs> That was tough to watch, but yeah, it was, it was, it was so, it was hard. Um, especially cause you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't a massive production and that was also part of why I really wanted to show up every single time is because it was like, you know, we had like a small van with all of the equipment in the back and that's where we would stay warm, you know, mm -hmm. like, while you guys were setting up the next shot, Julie and I would be like running back to the van and just like sitting in the car, he like, you know, getting warm again uh, yeah. for the next take. So I don't, I really enjoyed that, like that part of it. I don't know. I've, I also like my, my parents always, you know, we didn't, we didn't have like, we're not rich by any means, but we had enough. Um, but to the extent to where we always had to work for what we have. And so I think I always liked that kind of um, headspace in a way. Yeah. I always liked to live there, you know? Well, it definitely wasn't like a hundred million dollar production. That's for sure. No, no, no. But it was, it was amazing, man. Like the, the way that everything came together, it, it was just so cool. Like all those, I don't know. It's it's just those like almost hard memories in a way, just like the, the heart, you know, running back the van, just being cold. That's like my favorite memories from the thing. Yeah, <laughs> weird surprises. I mean, like the the movie too. It was just uh, I, I think everything we expected from it. It just went a little bit of a step further. Like, yeah. you know, I know Jack Danini, who was the director, and he wrote everything. He was and writer and literally everything. Uh, he he had like an idea for like what he thought the budget was gonna be, and it went through the roof way past that. Yeah. He he was expecting mm -hmm. to get 
I, I think he expected like good and he got great all the time. And mm. all, all the people who worked on the film too were like weirdly new to it, but also really talented. Mm -hmm. um, myself especially you know I was great <laughs> but everybody that worked on that film really brought their A game every single day yeah. and worked really hard I'm still I, I still work with Isaac do you remember Isaac Centrone I work with him all the time Isaac Isaac Centrone the sound, He's sound the guy? supervisor supervisor yes yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and then just a bunch of people I work with Sarah Clayton all the time she she hired yeah. me uh, gigs in the last two years yeah, i love sarah sarah's like sarah's awesome bro like she was always so like ready and just there and i don't know she just wor always worked so hard everybody everybody on that set was just a uh, awesome person to make connections with so even even when you're working on films that i mean any film you work on you just make great connections with mm -hmm. everybody especially because we worked there were some nights too where we worked uh in a bar do you remember the Diddy? Three nights that we yeah. We Dude, I love that place. The shoot in that was that. Now, like thinking back on it, that was one of my favorite places because, like, it it was such long. Sorry, and sorry to interrupt you, but it was such long days of shooting. And I don't know if you know this, but it was specifically long for me because I was doing Hello Dolly at the time on Broadway, and I was in the Pretty Woman workshops at the same time. Yeah, as shooting the movie. So for that whole entire month of shooting, which was supposed to be only two weeks, by the way, or at least that's what it said <laughs> in my contract, but that's besides the point. It ended up being a whole month and I think a little bit more, which is fine. But I ended up getting literally two hours of sleep every single night for a whole month. And it was, it, it I didn't feel good <laughs> by any means, but I loved doing it the whole time like I was like all right oh man let's go I got like I would go to like pretty woman workshops and literally I would show up and get there and I would take like a 10 minute nap right before we would start and they would always be like why are you so tired all the time Seppi I'm like just don't worry about it I'm just you know working on three projects at the same time it's okay it's okay just on Broadway um, big deal <laughs> yeah no, no literally so I would I would wake up um go to pretty woman workshops from like 10 a.m to i don't know 6 p.m then i would go to a show from 7 p.m until 11 p.m and then i would come to shoot at 12 a.m until 6 a.m so how, how are you literally, alive right now like i don't, I don't know i really don't know there was one time i specifically remember this i got i got stopped by the cops uh right here in my neighborhood like three blocks away from my house because i ran a red light so you know how they have those like red lights and they have the like green arrow turn left. And so I was so tired that night that I just like saw the green arrow turning left thingy and I thought it was green. And I, without even looking up, I just like ran the red light and immediately I got lit up. Um, and so he stopped me. He was like, hey, excuse me, can I license registration, all that. I was like, what, what's, the, what's the problem officer? <laughs> he said, you ran a red light. I was like, the... I'm so sorry. I apologize. I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so incredibly tired. I've been on set for like 14 hours straight. It's, I'm so sorry. And he was like, he looked at my address. He was like, you got any points on your license? I was like, no, none. And I, I really hope to keep it that way. I'm so sorry. And he was like, all right, well, need a license. And he's like, don't run a red light again. I was like, okay, bye. Yeah. Just it I was like, that's lucky. I'm so lucky. So lucky. The whole time you're telling that story, I'm sitting here thinking like, there's 40 people waiting for him, and he's getting pulled over. Like, Literally, on set, it was, it was crazy. Because you're the you're the star of the show. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy. I remember once we were waiting for Julia, uh, and she was coming from something else. Like she she was working on something else at the time too, mm -hmm. and she so she was running like 20 minutes late, and we were supposed to shoot with the sunset. And the sun was going down too fast. And we were like, oh, my God, we have to finish her makeup and get her out there and go. It was just like the rush of it. Yeah. You never expect with, with working on a film production, all the little things. When you want to film a sunset, you got like a 15-minute window before it's ruined. Literally. Yeah. Literally. And also, another thing that was crazy is we shot all over New York. 
We yeah. shot all over New York and it, it wasn't necessarily easy getting from Manhattan to Brooklyn at five o'clock. Yep. There was a lot of that. No? <laughs> uh, there was a lot of different locations because we filmed, I think in the end we wound up filming for like close to five or six weeks. I don't know. Yeah. And then I remember we stopped and then we had <laughs> at the, uh, at the wrap party, which was like two whole months after we wrapped production, like in December, late December or something, at the wrap party, Jack, the director, showed up with his camera and he's like, we have one more shot to get, we forgot. <laughs> and I was like, dude, come on, man. But it was, it was just the funniest thing because he, he finished like a final edit, or at least final at the time, and he was like, we're missing one small shot of, of Jeff. And we need this one shot of Jeff turning around and just reacting. And that was it. And it was just oh man, so funny because no one knew about it. And it was just a weird little That's thing. That's so strange, yeah. It was like well, a... I, have to, I have to ask. I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, filming for a musical, do you guys pre-recorded your vocals separately? Yeah. Then... So that... okay. Yeah, so that was actually one of the first things that we did was we went into the studio and figured out, oh, okay, so, you know, First off, it was like that was a whole process itself because, you know, making a musical like, yeah, you have all the music written, but OK, now we have to get it recorded. Now we have to, like, put the music arrangements all together so it makes sense with the with the dancing and the location and the editing and all that. So that was one of the first things we did um, was doing and, and shot and Robert Frost. He yeah. was an amazing music supervisor and one of the lights uh that kept that kept me going i think he was he was like he was just always so positive and so like fun um yeah it was really cool to like work with him as well yeah i remember at, at certain points uh because jack too he he came at it from a perspective of like he, he wrote all these songs and he wrote all the whole script and everything but he's by no like he, in no way is he like a singer or a musician or so when he brought on uh Robert Frost it was like cool you're gonna help me do all this like this is just literally make it real so he really brought it to life and when we were in the recording studio too that was another thing we had to consider was everything is spoken in verse so all these songs have to be perfectly timed and performed not only exceptionally well but in a timely manner so that they match up to the second so it doesn't throw off the rhythm of all the verse speaking. And it was just like, I remember at one point, like one line got messed up or something and it was either cut like four or five pages from the whole script because it fucks up all the verses or yeah. you just have to record the whole thing again. And it was like, yeah. Uh, that was for the most painstaking thing was the verse speaking. It was really difficult. Yeah. But once we made it work, it worked and it clicks together perfectly. Yeah. Um, so while, while working on this film, you were on Broadway. Tell us a little bit about your Broadway journey and where that started. And, how you got into that. and then uh, I think my Broadway journey is very unusual. And I always like to compare it to a movie because it, it always feels like that. Um, it, it really is just one of those, like, some a story you would see in a movie, I feel like. Um, I was doing a ballet competition. So I'm originally from Bern, Switzerland, for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, born and raised in Bern, Switzerland. I moved to the United States when I was 11 years old. My mom is Brazilian. My dad's Italian. And we're all ballet dancers. My brother's a ballet dancer with the Paris Opera Ballet. And my sister is a carpenter. So she made it out alive, basically. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so... All of those languages too. Am I? Am I yeah. Right? Yes, I speak Portuguese, Italian, French, English, German, Swiss German, and Spanish. Cool. Uh, translate all of these podcasts for us later on. <laughs> you know, let's go. Let's go. Different languages. Um, so I was doing a ballet competition in New York City uh, called YAGP Youth America Grand Prix, and I won third place that year. Um, it's a world ballet competition, the largest student ballet competition in the world. And Nora Brennan, the kids casting director, saw me there and asked me to audition for Billy Elliot. The next day I auditioned. I missed my flight back to Switzerland. I didn't even speak English at the time. Um, I literally got through the audition process by just like 
nodding and agreeing and being like, oh, yes, yes, uh uh-huh, yes. And at one point they asked me, like, there's a tap step called a buffalo. And they were like, okay, so here you do a buffalo and you do this. And I just looked at them and was like, "Uh uh-huh. And so they they were like, oh, he doesn't, he doesn't understand. Like, he doesn't know what this is. (laughs) And they're like, okay, so this is Buffalo. So they showed me and they were obviously, they, they obviously hired me because they understood that I could adapt and learn very quickly. Um, so after doing Billy Elliot for two and a half years, I did um, Springs Awakening at the Barrow Group Theater in New York. Uh, when I was 15, I played Melchior. And that was my first straight play experience. That was my first experience with like just a play and acting, straight acting. At 16, I went into Newsies. Uh, and again, when I was 17, then it closed. At 18, I went into Aladdin. I ended up doing a TV show in Canada uh, right before I did Aladdin, where I also played the, not heartthrob per se, um, but I, I played the the guy who steals the main girlfriend, you know, just the (laughs) villain basically. Um, But without actually being a villain. Anyway, um, after that I did Aladdin and I went into Cats when I was 19, 20, I did Hello Dolly and I turned 21 in Chicago while doing Hamilton in Chicago. And now right up until this pandemic hit, I was doing Hamilton on Broadway. Where where are you now? Are you in New York at the moment? Now I'm in Jersey. I'm I'm sitting in my house in uh, <laughs> Union City, Jersey. You know, what's the, um, what's the whole deal with? I know Broadway is not even opening up for the rest of the year. Do literally, you have an idea of what you're gonna do. I know you're behind the camera a little bit now too, but is that the main focus now because Broadway is not an option? Honestly, more and more now, I'm realizing how in love with it I am. Uh, with 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 uh, film and, and filming and behind the camera, um, I I just think it's so cool. I think it's so cool, and I I have so much fun with it. And the job is like it, it's amazing because you you know you prepare for so long and then you go out and shoot, um, and then you come back and this is where the fun begins, right? In the in the in the edit, editing room, it's the most gruesome long painstaking process but it's awesome it's fun um but yeah so I've, I've really been enjoying that and I hope that in the future I get to like do that and because I'm a dancer so this is I think the main reason why I started doing films um specifically of dance is because I've been watching dance on film for extremely long and a lot of it is never captured through the eyes of a dancer, which I think there's different nuances. And I think there's different ways of capturing a movement um, that a non-dancer wouldn't necessarily do or wouldn't. And a lot of times it's cut together in such a weird way to where like the person cutting it together didn't know what, what's supposed to look good. They're like, oh, this this looks cool. All right, I'll throw this in. And it's like, we're looking at it and we're like, why would you put a whole sickle foot in that shot? And like, why would you put a <laughs> shot in there where the leg was completely bent? And like, what's wrong with people, you know? And so finally I'm like, you know what? Why don't I just take it into my own hands um, and try to make some epic looking dance content? Yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know to relate. <laughs> But the only way I can relate to it is uh, choreographing fight scenes, where right. these different styles of filming a fight scene, you can do it like like the Jason Bourne movies. Matt mm-hmm. Damon, he doesn't know how to fight people. Mm-hmm. But they film it with all these tight angles and these quick shots, and it makes it look like he knows all these moves. Right. They filmed him the same way they filmed Bruce Lee or Chuck Norris or all these guys that can actually fight with like mm-hmm. wider angles. It'd be like, wow, look at this stupid idiot that can't throw a kick. You know? Yeah, literally. Uh, and you notice all those things, and it's weird. Yeah. And white movies, I guess, are more way more common that you can notice that. But it's for any medium. Like, if you know dancing and you see that happening, you're like, that actor's not a dancer because they right. aren't moving a way that it is. Absolutely. Or uh, absolutely. Or something. If you watch the cooking show, 
and you mm-hmm. said he acting was like playing a cook and he was throwing in weird ingredients you'd be like why the fuck would you mix those things you know yeah um, <laughs> yeah exactly so i'm hoping i'm basically what i'm hoping for in the future is that like people will be like oh we have this dance that we need to shoot in this like massive movie who can we call to like make it look amazing <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, call up Sebi. Like, he's he, he's the main guy. You know, like that's sort of my goal. Also, he has to speak Portuguese and Italian and <laughs> other languages. Also, he needs to have been in at least five Broadway shows. That's the minimum <laughs> right flyer. No main criteria. It's crazy that you've done all this stuff and you're 22. Yeah, I, I just turned 23 recently, very recently. Uh, well, still, still unaccomplished right now. I still wasn't <laughs> <open accomplished. laughs> So, Giuseppe, we, we asked you for your movie of choice, and you said, almost without hesitation, Scarface. Let's talk about Scarface. I want to talk about Scarface. Absolutely. Let's do it. So, tell, talk to us about Scarface. What, what, why do you love that movie so much? Okay. So, I think it is, first off, it's a genius movie. Um, I love Al Pacino in it. I love the way it was directed. It's just so iconic in what it is. Um, The way that the story was told, the history in it. Uh, I think, so just to give you a little bit of backstory, in Switzerland, when I was like 18, I went home real quick and I, my dad wasn't home, my mom wasn't home and I got into my dad's like 20 some year old Cuban cigars back in the day from when you used to smoke. Keep in mind, these are 20 year old cigars that weren't kept in like, what do you call those things that like keep some moist, hu- not a humidifier, uh, a humidor? humidor? Yeah, a humidor. humidor. Yeah, a humidor. And so they were brittle, they were dry. It was like it leaves. It was just dry leaves. <laughs> <laughs> and I got myself a bottle of wine cause you're able to drink in Switzerland at 18 legally no problem having fun (laughs) and uh i cooked myself a delicious steak and i sat down on a big table we have in switzerland and uh i put on scarface and i just sat back and relaxed and i felt like such a mob boss i felt like such a mafioso (laughs) while this whole thing was happening and it was so eating steak I'm eating a steak, oh, medium rare, bloody steak, while sipping on my glass of wine, while having a cigar in my other hand, while watching Scarface. <laughs> I think the only thing you were missing is the mountain of cocaine in front of you. Literally just a mountain of cocaine and my pet tiger off in the corner. Yeah. But I felt so cool at the time. Um, you know, when you're 18, you do, you do that kind of stuff, but... I don't know. It's it's just my fa- it's just my favorite movie. Like I I've watched it probably six or seven times at this point. I mean that's that's what I did when I was eighteen. I had a pet tiger and I was doing mountains of cocaine. So that's <laughs> you're describing my childhood. That's how I grew up. Uh, yeah. What uh yeah. What what was Scarface the first movie that was like let's get a pet tiger, like. Because I, I know they did it for a bunch of other things. But. Especially with, um, with, with, what was it, Tiger King coming out on Netflix? Tiger Didn't King, yeah. dude, the, the doctor dude, or the self-proclaimed doctor dude, didn't he provide the tiger? Oh, I don't know. Because he provided, like, a ton of tigers for Hollywood. I know, that was, Maybe. that was, like, almost 40 years ago. Was he around doing that stuff then? I think he was. I think he's old enough. Wow. Yeah. yeah that was in the 80s. You guys are like 60s, and some of them are even in their 70s or so. so yeah. So they would have done it, yeah. Wow. Yeah. If been young, they'd have been like 25-year-old guys wrangling tigers. but right, Literally just having that love. And I think that's when like Joe Exotic and, and that dude, um, Ansel, something Ansel, right? I think that's his name. Anyway, yeah, I think so. Uh, I think that's when they like started. Is they started at like eighteen, nineteen years old, you know. So I think it's possible. Well, that's a clusterfuck of a documentary. That whole thing. Oh my god, it was hooked. I was hooked. Yeah. For anyone who hasn't oh, seen yeah. Tiger King, go watch it. It's amazing. Go watch 
you need to cook yourself a nice medium rare steak. Medium rare. <laughs> get your wine, get a cigar, pile of- 20-year-old dry, ashy cigar. <laughs> and then just watch Scarface and Tiger King at the same time. At the yeah. same time. <laughs> Two different monitors <laughs> at the same time. What a mix. What a yeah. mix. Truly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, anyway. I gotta say, when you suggested Scarface, I didn't roll my eyes, but I was like, I haven't seen that movie in years. I wonder if I'm still going to feel the same way about it. I definitely don't feel the same way I felt about it when I watched it when I was like 14 years old, uh -huh. but I also watched it with like a bunch of dudes who were like, this is awesome. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know? <laughs> it was, it was definitely surreal rewatching it because I, I, I felt like I had like, I, of course, I've seen it before. I know it. I haven't seen it since then. And I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but that was a long, <laughs> long, long time ago. So it was, it was like watching it for the first time again. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so different having this something-year-old lens watching it now than when I was like 14. You're <laughs> absolutely right. It's amazing how differently we perceive movies mm -hmm. that we saw like way back when and then when we see them again now. Um, really I always love to know how we'll perceive Tiger King in 20 years. <laughs> yeah, truly. truly. <laughs> um, it, it really is amazing. Um, there, yeah, yeah, perceive it differently. <laughs> I, yeah, anyway, I, love, I love Scarface. Um, I, I also think I love it just because, like, so first off, obviously, like, my dad's Italian and I feel very Italian, and I think a lot of Italian people even though obviously the mafia is like very looked down upon and whatnot, I feel like a lot of Italian people have a pride, like a mafioso pride. Oh, you know, yeah. Just, just for the fact that you're Italian and just for the fact that the mafia is Italian and that like, you know, like you don't know who I am. You know, you just the, just the fact that you're Italian is you can say that. And truly be like, you don't, you don't know that I got a cousin, Vinny, who, you know, who's whacked a few people, who's made people go sleep with the fishes. You don't know that. You know, like. <laughs> I know, it's, it's honestly, it's so true. And I think the way yeah. that, like, uh, the mafia has been portrayed, you know, in, in Hollywood for so long, you know, we definitely romanticize that life. And um, I don't know if you've ever read um, Man of Honor by Joe Bonanno. Um yeah. It's it's an autobiography from the head of the Bonanno crime family. And it's so interesting to see life through his eyes and like the way, like he, he told this story and it was fascinating for me um, about when he came over um, from Italy and, you know, they were living in their little neighborhood and he had nothing, his family had nothing. So they go into the local restaurant, his local pub and this guy came in and he couldn't afford to pay for his food. Mm. And the local crime boss said, it's okay. You take, take what you need, take what you want. Yeah. And yeah. so their whole view of the mafia and the crime bosses that were in charge are like, they're taking care of their people however they need to. So if this day he can't pay next time when I call on him, he'll pay what he needs to right. when yeah. I need him to. Right. And so exactly. like, it's such an interesting, like, well, I'm just doing what I need to do to take care of my people. Right. Absolutely. And it's amazing because, so my dad's from Naples, Italy, where the main mm. crime family is the Camorra. Mm. And he lived in a neighborhood where, I mean, like, you would have to, like, duck your head because there were bullets flying in the morning. Wow. Literally. And his neighbor decided not to pay up one day. You know, every Sunday after church, people get back home. There's this eight-year-old boy who comes around, knocks on doors, taxes. Every Sunday, knock, 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 taxes. His neighbor decided not to pay up one day. His car was on fire the next day. Um, there is so much of that that actually happens. Like my grandpa, he had a brand new Fiat 500, uh, or it might have been a Fiat Panda. It, it's like, but this is like the 50s, right? The 50s, when he this was his first car he was like 40 some years old his first car could finally afford it and got his driver's license and whatnot 
But the next day after he got the car, literally the next day, he went downstairs in the morning and all the tires were missing. And of course, some young fella walks over to him and he's like, oh man, that's crazy that they would do that to you. That's so annoying. You know, I think I know who did it. Damn, but I think it's going to take like 20 or $30 for me to remember. <laughs> and so, of course, he had to pay him real quick. And lo and behold, a few hours later, the tires were back on the car. Isn't that funny how that works? Isn't yeah. that funny? Isn't that so strange? But but I, yeah, I, so it's cool. I think that, you know, the, obviously, Scarface is not Italian. No, it's, no, not at all. No, it's, Cuban, but there is that connection with Al Pacino and like seeing like these gangster movies. And I think that, you know, it also, while it's not the Godfather and it's not mafia movies, it's not Goodfellas, it's its own thing. Yeah. Italian people still definitely clamp onto that movie because of all of the connections with it. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely, it's a very interesting rewatch. I'm, I'm yeah. appreciative that you selected it. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was yeah I, I love it it's awesome what, what do you think would you if, if given the opportunity and they did another reboot because they always do reboots would you play tony montana would you go yes. for it 100%? yes but there is a but there i would be uh, it, i would have to know in advance who the director was i would have to uh, trust and understand what he's going to do with the movie Cause it's like it's a gamble, it's a gamble when you try to reboot movies like that, you know. Truly, because they're such iconic movies from the '80s, and people are always gonna hate. People are always gonna be like, eh, "It wasn't as good as the original," and eh, this and eh, that. But like, yeah, I would definitely do it. That'd be so sick. I think that's one of those movies that maybe could get a reboot just because of how old it is mm -hmm. and just to see i would love to see al pacino playing i forget the character's name but the the guy that tony montana was working for most of the movie for the first half the old, yeah yeah, yeah. And that would be cool. connection and then the new guy is tony montana whatever but oh, man uh, yeah like margot robbie in to replace michelle pfeiffer yeah Yes. Now you want to do it because Margot Robbie. <laughs> I'm so down. I'm so down. Yes. As long as your girlfriend's cool with that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. Uh -huh, totally. That's the other person that needs to approve of the director and the co-stars. And <laughs> exactly. Uh, Tony Montana, dream role. I'll direct it. Here we go. Let's do it. Done. Let's go. I'm, an, I'm done. Right. Get, get writing. You're going to write it. Let's do okay. it. <laughs> I, honestly, Victoria is writing a, a whole thing about mafia and mobs and... Are you really? Yeah, yeah. I'm working on a, a, a series um, idea for basically where the mafia is now. Mm -hmm. That's actually really interesting because it is very different. Yeah, I read, an, now. I read there... an article about the mafia in Italy um, and how so many, they crack down so hard, so many of the men are in jail and left this big void that is now being filled by the women. And the mm -hmm. women, in some cases, are just as ruthless, if not more ruthless, than the men were. They went from having essentially no power in this to having all of it. And so, You're right. yeah, so that. I thought that was a really interesting angle to look at it and what yeah. that would be like in the American mafia, how that would translate. That's actually really interesting you should say that. And, and also, um, uh, to add on top of that, a lot of the mafia today, I think, is also working with other organizations. Mm -hmm. um, especially in Italy, there is this huge crackdown happening on like um, Nigerian gangs in Italy, especially in, in Sicily. Um, just because like a lot, you know, a lot of them immigrated into, into Italy because that's like the, cl a close refuge, let's call it. Um, 
and it's so interesting to like hear about these these cases where like literally just Nigerian gangs and mafias are all like interconnected and they're all getting arrested at the same time because the mafia, because they don't want to like be um, accredited with a murder or whatever. And they'll just be like, Oh, let's, let's have like one of the Nigerian guys do it. And it's, it's like, and they obviously they go back and forth like that. And it, it's just so interesting to like see how the mafia now is like interwoven with other organizations. And I mean, that's probably always been like that, like the Chinese triads and, you know, all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They all get meetings together and they all just sit down at a round table. Yeah, I know. Literally just like, wait, what is that? What, what's that place called? The, uh, where they have like all of the countries sitting. The United, like the United Nations. Is it? Yeah, the United, well, wow, just happy. The United <laughs> Nations, thank you. But yeah, the United yeah. Nations crime families. I think it'd be hysterical to see this happening now in, 2020 with coronavirus oh my god mob bosses on a zoom chat <laughs> literally yo that's actually really funny so how are all the murders going in china like- <laughs> speaking in code words did the gummy bear drop off the white rabbit <laughs> you guys that's a whole so far, the triad which literally is the next thing you made up uh <laughs> kind of spread over to our side of things like oh. Man, that's so funny. Uh, oh, man, you want me to tell you guys to wear masks when they go out whacking people. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be really funny. I'm really curious to see how the film world and even the Broadway world, too, adapts to coronavirus. If there's going to be a situation where, like, you get your temperature taken before you go on stage or, mm-hmm. or if they have a vaccine before they even can open Broadway back up. Yeah. Well, I know I was, um, I, I have a lot of, friends in the, the Philadelphia theater scene and one of the big theaters there released like this whole how they're adapting their front of house like the the, the seating the audience all of that to um open for mm-hmm. the next season but there's this huge outcry from the performers and from from the stagehands and everybody like this first of all this doesn't actually spread people out enough by six feet and you're not accounting for how we can do shows on stage while maintaining social distance if we it's can't impossible. if we can't have masks it's not possible you can't do it it's literally impossible there is yeah. no way there is no way to do that and not just that it's also like you know enclosed spaces the air conditioning blasting moving all of the air around in there spreading it to different people and that's one of the that's one of the so we had a recently we had a meeting with uh Lynn Manuel Miranda and all the creatives and the producer Jeffrey Seller um, so that they just wanted to let us know like where we stand and what's going on um, in the middle of this virus. And Jeffrey was very adamant about we can't return to work unless I know that every single person in that theater is 100% safe. Because it's not worth returning to work knowing that you even have blood on your hands because someone died because you decided to Oh, well, it's business. We need to open it back up. (laughs) Look at that. We have 50 people. I just killed 50 people with my business decision. Cool. You know, and so he was very adamant and very, he he felt very strongly about that, that until every single person is guaranteed 100% safety, as much as safety can be, you know, provided. I think that's hitting home now too, because the Broadway actor, Nick Cordero just died yesterday. And we're recording this a couple days in advance, but uh you know when when somebody actually dies you kind of see the gravity of it and you're like well this is actually gonna hurt some people and this guy was 41 41 and it's not just that he was also very loved by the broadway community like his name as far as i know didn't have an ounce of dirt on it everyone always just like raved about nick cordero you know on and off stage and they were just like he's the greatest person blah 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 you know this and that and so it really hits home. Um, well, coronavirus yeah, doesn't wrong. care if you're a good or a bad person. It's just a virus. And it's a virus. We have, we have to be patient. And I think once they have a vaccine and they can actually spread it and yep. get people the immunity they need, right? that it's safe for people to be all up in each other's business. Because I honestly, I just watched Hamilton on Disney Plus yesterday too. And it's awesome, by the way. First, yeah, first it's amazing. They already watched it twice. Yeah. <laughs> 
uh, and you're in it. You're, <laughs> you're, you're in it, and that shows how good it is. Uh, but, you know, they're up in each other's faces. They're jumping, holding each other. They're kissing well, each other. And backstage, you can't – it's so close quarters. It's so yeah. close quarters. And we're interacting with dressers, stagehands. We're interacting with everybody. The theater is a living organism that interacts. It changes hands. It breathes. It moves. And there is no way to stop that or you stop the show. And so it's either you have the show or you don't have the show. Okay. You know? I think the smart decision is to not have the show for now. It well, sucks, but everyone yeah, it is. It sucks. You know, on Disney Plus. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to suck even worse, I think, when we realize that, oh, wait, we're going to be unemployed past September. I was able to, like, put, for example, I was able to put my mortgage on hold until September. But at the end of September, I have to pay everything in full. And I think that's what a lot of people didn't, like, realize when they went into forbearance and, you know, did all that, they were like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll pay it off one day and I'll just like re remortgage or refinance my mortgage and whatnot. And I've been putting every penny off to the side just so I can pay that in full and like not lose the house. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and also as actors, we're not used to saving, I feel like. We're not used to like, or at least most actors I know don't really save money. Yeah, for well, and I think that it's it's difficult, especially when you are in a gig economy, especially as as actors, as people who work on film sets and everything. A lot of times, you know, I mean, I know so many people. I know I personally, I haven't even gone out for certain auditions because they're for smaller regional theaters that don't pay enough. They so, don't. no, they don't. So, like, when you get to this point where now, you know, and, and a lot of actors have and stage crew and, and filmmakers, they have jobs as in catering, they have jobs as waiters, as bartenders, and that is a gig economy as well. So now all of that is shut down. Mm -hmm. Literally, my one friend was like, I work in as a museum tour guide, as a bartender, and as a performer, and all of her industries are shut down. Mm -hmm. And they have no sign of coming back anytime soon. So it's just, it's really, it's hard for people to really look at the long term when mm -hmm. their day to day life is I'm doing this for this month and next next three months right. I'm on this and the next you know next year I'm doing this. Right. So it, it is hard to kind of look forward and, and try and have that financial planning thing in your brain mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of make it muscle memory. But it's also hard when, you know, people are saddled with debt coming out of college learning filmmaking or, or going to school for theater and everything and then you, you get jobs where it doesn't you're doing it for the passion of it but yeah. it's not going to pay the bills so then yeah. you know that comes along and really throws everyone for a loop yeah. i know everyone was posting all of those like when hamilton came out um you know as you're watching hamilton just remember to call your senators because all those people are unemployed and it's an eight minute credit sequence of like this many people and i also right. saw other people that were like you know, there are also people who are, you know, not at the top tier of Hamilton is the top tier of Broadway. Right. They're much lower. Well, everyone deserves this. Like everyone right. deserves, you know, to have be taken care of during this time. You know, and, and it's just another thing I realize is I am so, so incredibly lucky and blessed mm -hmm. that I get to do what I do at the level of Hamilton. That's like a list Broadway, you know. And mm -hmm. If you're an actor, if you're a dancer, if you're a singer, whatever it is, you know you don't go into this expecting to make money. Right. Or if you do, you're in the wrong field. Yes. You know, you go into this no like loving because you feel like you need to express and tell the story. You need to express yourself through it. And it's an amazing way to do so. But we just know that there isn't much um money in the general arts to be made yeah um but at the end it, it but it's i don't know it's very few people who profit off of it and it's okay. yeah that's a whole other discussion that's but, a whole, whole other discussion you know it does, it does you know it this whole thing has definitely shed a very strong light on all of the the way we were functioning you know right. the way we were how Everyone wants to get back to normal, but was normal actually working for most people? Right. I don't think it was. So when we get no, back, was, 
and that's another i mean that's another whole entire discussion that we could talk about for hours is some sort of like economic reform that needs to happen especially being from switzerland we have such a different way of doing things keep in mind we're also a much much smaller country um by far and we have a completely different governing system and we have you know we have a parliament where we elect the people elect 10 people uh to take office and those 10 people then have to agree at least seven of them have to agree for something to get passed um and those people only stay in office for two to three years at a time you know so those people get rotated out all the time um but in the, in the United States, it's such a polarized governing system built on so many flaws, unfortunately. And it is, it is technically still a very new governing system um, in, in the world that we live in now. Like we see so many other countries that have been around for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. And they've sort of started to like figure themselves out in a way. As wrong as some of those places are also. but you know, the United States has only been around for what, two, 300 years. Yeah. yeah. I feel so like we're, according to we're, in our, <laughs> we're, in our, we're in our petulant teenage years right now where yeah. you know, we, think, we think we know everything, but we really don't. And, yeah. You know, you know who I was we, listening to when I was a petulant teenager, Kanye West. <laughs> well, would you look at that? Kanye West 2020. Here we go. Oh my God! See, oh. I I I laughed at that initially, and then I cried because I said the same thing when Donald Trump said he was going to run for president. I was like, "Yes, not." Oh That's no! Well, I don't, first I don't lady, Kim Kardashian. Past, no, I don't put anything past the year 2020 anymore. Yeah, put nothing past it. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to have to start watching the show Keeping Up with the Kardashians because oh my God, taking place in the White House. That's pretty. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even think of that. <laughs> no, I need you to think about it. That sounds no, awful. no. On that note, Giuseppe, thank you for joining us. Um, <laughs> it's been absolutely wonderful. I can't wait to see everyone. Okay. <laughs> see you all in Kanye West's America. Woo! <laughs> all right, but no, really, Giuseppe, thank you for coming thank on you and. So much. This and discussing so everything with us this was this was fantastic it was really great to have you on the show today thanks guys yeah man it was great catching up we'll talk to you soon yeah man can't wait all right big thank you to giuseppe for joining us to talk to us about his broadway career his movies that he's been in is getting behind the camera and learning some stuff there that's really interesting really cool it's cool to see talented people i can't believe he's 23 i can't believe that i know I'm just gonna hide my gray hair now and like go hide in a corner. Like, <laughs> I can't. I, no, I, you know what? The hat. That's that's the. You key. know what? Vera Wang didn't start her line until she was in her 40s. So it doesn't matter how old you are. Remember that, people listening. Yeah. Do yeah. your stuff you whenever you feel like it. He was like 43. Came up with Spider-Man 40 years into his life. So I've got 10 years until it really sinks in. <laughs> And then it's like, all right, now you got to get something out there. <laughs> That's it. Uh, but that was fun talking to Giuseppe. Let's talk about his movie of choice, Scarface. Tell me uh, your initial thought. You watch Scarface, and what's the first thing you think after the credits start rolling? My first thought was I loved the story of it. Um, they obviously, it's, I mean, it's so epic in the way that they portrayed everything. Everything was so, and I think, you know, that was a, a choice, you know, by the director to like, they're living in this world of extreme excess, like living to excess in all ways, money, drugs, you know, just riches, everything. And so obviously the, the film itself was done in a very dramatic, epic way. But I think my personal opinion is if you're gonna tell a story about these people who are so ridiculous in a lot of ways, so extreme and so ridiculous, and, and in a lot of ways not really relatable in, 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 in certain things, if they had gone a little more realistic with 
the storytelling it, 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 with how they, they portrayed everything, maybe I would have connected with the characters a little more. Um, what, do you, what do you mean? You've never dealt incredible amounts of cocaine and had a pet tiger before? That's never been your situation? I mean, I thought about it for a little bit, but, you know, I decided ultimately let's not do that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think that, you know, I, it's, it's a classic film and it's definitely an 80s film and you can tell that. I think I was um, discussing with, with Nick uh, after we watched it last night of how, like, you know, you can watch The Godfather over and over and over again and you don't feel like it's a dated film necessarily you know like you, that one stands the test of time a little more whereas scar scar i almost said scar tissue because of my damn show scarface <laughs> scarface is definitely it's it's dated not only in the time that they told it and you know they told it in the 80s but like you can it's an 80s film 100 yeah, percent. yeah i think when it opens up and it's showing all these different shots of immigrants getting off of boats and people coming to America and trying to like it, I think that stuff too was all like real footage or maybe even found footage I don't know if it was shot for the movie or if someone came upon I think somehow it must have been back then I don't think there was no internet back then to be like let's pull all this footage off but I mean I think they probably got you know archives you know from the government archives of you know or news archives and that kind of thing to get that footage so I don't I think that definitely could have been real footage if it if it wasn't um when they were pulling when I saw that footage I was like oh this is old this is really old like it looks like it wouldn't stand the test of time like you can tell it's from the 80s like way back um but then I think once they got into the actual film yeah. it was more where they obviously didn't look exactly like that. Um, I couldn't, personally, I couldn't get over his accent a lot of the time. And a lot of time I was like, there's no one on earth that sounds like this. There's no person, I've never heard of a human being that speaks like Tony Montana. I've heard people talk that way. I didn't think it was that. I mean, it might've been a little overdone because he's not actually Hispanic. His accent was definitely better than the woman playing his sister. Mm. The woman playing his sister, her accent was horrible. It was so bad. I couldn't tell if she was like, she had a French accent, she had no accent sometimes. She had what she thought was a Hispanic accent. I thought her accent was- I think about her accent, I didn't even notice that, but yeah, you're 100% right. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, something else that was, was difficult to watch, I guess now through, you know, this new kind of, social consciousness that we're all having of like put people of color in roles that were made for people of color obviously it's the 80s different time but it was while Al Pacino is brilliant in this role um it was it's hard for me to watch him and the woman who played his sister because she's also she's Italian she doesn't have any Hispanic roots at all um it was hard to watch people that I know are not of color play these roles it's the same thing with, with dancers. Like we were talking with Giuseppe about how dancers can notice when dance choreography doesn't make any sense in a movie. Mm. Or when filmmakers yeah. that no fighting, uh, no fight styles and things like that. When you see someone who can't fight in a movie and you're like, wow, this guy's really phoning it in or he doesn't know what he's doing. It's the same thing even more so with accents because people with that accent are immediately like fully aware that this person is not from their town. <laughs> Not at all. Well, I, it, but it's more than just the accent thing. It's, you know, you know, it, yeah, a, a Cuban Hispanic accent is very different than, you know, an accent, than other, you know, lo localities that have those accents. But I think that it's, I don't know if necessarily his accent was bad. Um, I know you had a hard time understanding him, but I don't know if that necessarily meant that his accent was accent. inaccurate. He mumbles a lot, like he was trying yes. to talk really low and growly and that's just, yeah. just Al Pacino also so I, I don't think Al Pacino I, I honestly I, I don't know because I don't think anyone else could have played this character but at the same time I kind of wish someone did <laughs> I mean I, I definitely there are people there like I, I I know I've said it before multiple times I will say it a lot of times too like no one else could play that person yes they can you well, know, it just to Robert De Niro first, and Robert De Niro turned it down. 
But mm. I, think, I think that would have been a terrible choice, to be honest. Imagine Robert De Niro playing a Cuban person. Like, it would have, that's even worse. That's it was perfect. kind of gruesome. Granted, the <laughs> 80s. I get they're not going to, they're not going to do that, which is frustrating. I don't know how many of the people that were, like, playing his henchmen and stuff were not also, um, you know, Hispanic. But, you know, that that's obviously a, an issue that has come to light now. I think when I first watched it, when I was, like, 14, I didn't even think about it. I, at the time, because I'm not Hispanic, but I could pass as Hispanic, I thought, oh, you know, that's a whole field of, of, of roles that I could play because I look like I could, you know, I could have played Tony Montana's sister, you know, blah, 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 blah. Now, obviously, I think differently. I'm like, no, 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 those roles are not meant for me. No, no, no. But, um, you know. Only, you know, white woman or person in the movie, pretty much everybody else is – a Cuban immigrant or somebody else. Some of the FBI guys are there, but it's the FBI guys and her husband. I don't. He wasn't Frank. I don't think he was supposed to be. He had a weird accent, but like he also, I thought he said he was Jewish at some point. I don't know. Yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't it, follow it, him. Rather, like it should have been a very diverse movie. I think they put some white people in there <laughs> as yeah. as these characters, but they. You know, Michelle Pfeiffer was probably the only person that was white and I think intended to be white and should have been white and played by I'm her. not happy, like, I'm not happy with her, her whole storyline and the whole thing. Like, I don't, I think they spent so much time establishing Tony Montagna and establishing him as, you know, like, how he deals with people and, and his dealings with cocaine and his dealings in the drug industry that they completely glossed over they just had her there to be eye candy and they didn't actually establish like why did she marry him she's the much more interesting character than just being there to be pretty and for him to be possessive over why did she marry him why did she decide i mean she freaks out at dinner and talks about why she doesn't want to have kids with him um and then she just disappears you don't see her for the rest of the movie she's an interesting character why did they not show her more yeah. it's really frustrating I, it's another one of those scenarios where there's this interesting character that could have very much had their own movie i don't think it could have been a situation where there was a scarface and then a spin-off of scarface with her character i don't think that would have worked but if the movie from the from the jump had been about scarface but also had a much bigger focus on michelle pfeiffer's character would i think that would have been really interesting I also thought Gina had, uh, his sister had a more interesting story too, or a very interesting perspective. Um, like being the sister of this drug lord that keeps coming around and throwing money and he's overprotective and he's barely around, but then he's too, like it's, it's all extremes. And I feel like yeah, that. I felt there were a lot of things that they glossed over because they either, it was, it was a long movie, like it was two and a half hours. Um, so they obviously didn't have time to expand on certain things, um, but they expand, like, there was that whole 80s montage, um, I felt like they should have been, like, working out or something, they had that whole, like, montage once he got into power and took over, um, after he killed Frank, that, you know, I don't, there was, I don't, I don't know, I just, it feels to me like the movie is incomplete. To me. Yeah, there, you feel like there's yeah. part. It, it's something that very well could have been like an HBO series if they had made it today. Um, yeah, like I feel like there's so much more to the story that they just didn't get to. That you know, it's it it was frustrating. I wanted to see you know more about um. What about even his his best friend Manny? Um, that he ends up shooting in the end because he's psychotic. Um, yeah. but you know that whole thing. There, there was just so much more I wanted to see and didn't get to. Um, now that I, you know, I'm actually watching it clearly as an adult. Um, but it, you know, it's a classic film. So many people, you know, it's so just etched into our, our, uh, you know, social consciousness at this point. You know, you can't say, say hello to my little friend, you know, without thinking obviously like that's made fun of in cartoons and in you know pop culture and all that stuff 
Um, I mean, it's something then, that spawns so many things from it. Like they, 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 it, like it's in, it's in music everywhere. It's just so in pop culture. There's spawned in the video games. They did the whole thing with like the pet tiger. That's, I think that's originally from Scarface. No one else had a pet tiger. No one else ever yeah. thought of that. And when I, when I, I knew Scarface is where that idea came from, because they did it most notably in like I, I, the thing I think of is from Hangover, where Mike Tyson has a tiger. Mm -hmm. That's the thing I remember. But I knew that he did it because Scarface did it. But even in the movie, they show the tiger for like twelve seconds. It's just like, oh, look at yeah. tiger. They don't even go near it. He, it's not like he's walking the tiger on a fucking leash or anything. But yeah. Back in the 80s, there was nothing like that. There was no, they had the Godfather where everybody was like really good with their suits and, you know, acted proper until they had to do the bad thing. Scarface was like, nah, I'm going to be this crazy asshole all the fucking time. Everywhere yeah. I go, every relationship I have is going to be bananas. And it was. Cocaine's a hell of a drug. I mean, and it definitely, you know, this film is so over the top in so many ways, especially his death uh, at the end of the film and all of that. Uh, yeah. I felt, like, I felt like I was playing a video game where the bad guys just kept respawning. I was like, how many of these guys are there? And how can he take out this many? He's been shot 50 times. Like, it was so ridiculous at the end. He was having a heart attack or his heart was palpitating from having too much cocaine. And then he has to snort out of this giant pile in front of him while he's having that. Then he gets shot 50 million times. And I don't care how coked up you are. After like five or six bullets, you're probably going down. Yeah. Um, and it took a shotgun to the back in order for him to like finally go down. It was just, it was, I mean, it's, it's such an overdramatic soap opera of what that life. Yeah. Welcome to the like. That was the 80s in a nutshell. It set the tone for 80s movies. Uh, I mean, that the thing that bothered me about that part was when it's this ridiculous gunfire, everybody's shooting at him, and this dude that looks like a knockoff Terminator with the shotgun walking up behind him slowly is not getting shot. He's not dodging bullets. He's not even trying to act quick. He's like walking slowly into gunfire, and he's just unaffected. But... You know, the the filmmakers obviously took incredible liberties when they did that. Um, yeah, these were all conscious choices that they made yeah. to make this movie as, like, epic and dramatic as possible, you know? And, right. and, and that's, that's a choice and that's a decision. And, you know, I think that I, I, I said last night after watching it, I was like, I just, I feel like it was, in some ways it was, perfect for the time that it was made in like it was but at this at the same time I feel like it was the story warrants more so I felt like it was told too soon you know like maybe if they had done this 20 years later I felt like there would have been a more well-rounded story out of it there was just so much that was about like I might, checking women out and all I, that other stuff but I disagree with you because this movie I feel was the influence for so much stuff that was told today that without this movie, I don't think you're going to get a lot of the movies that we've seen that take influence from Scarface and maybe take this one element of it that really works and hone in on that much more. Uh, because Scarface, I think at the time, was such an original, different thing that, like, I, I, I wish I had seen it in 1983, you know? Like, that was yeah. that would have been the best time to see it. And I think that's why when I told my parents, we're going to watch Scarface, they were like, cool, we can reenact the whole movie for you because we memorized it because it's the greatest movie. Like, they love it so much because I think for them, that was, like, the first thing like it. There was nothing like it. No one ever had a fucking tiger. No one, no, they never made movies about guys that sold cocaine but also did a shitload of cocaine. And I think that spawned into a lot of different things. And, uh, you know, it uh, should be noted, too, that this is one of the few movies that are a little older that 
profited a lot. Uh, it, its budget was somewhere between 23 and 37 million. It's kind of unclear, um, at least on Wikipedia. I, mean, I, I was just watching that movie going, how the fuck? Like all of the sets, everything was so extravagant. Like, yeah. and then, the and then everything. The style. Right? And then everything that they had to do with, you know, the death scenes and the killing and destroying places and all that stuff, like, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. I mean, and then Al Pacino is a big name at that point, and, you know. That's my favorite thing about movies, when they spend so much money building something, and then they destroy it. Because that's the best. I mean, th that's the thing, too. You only get one shot at blowing apart a chair or blowing a hole through a wall, because then, then the hole's in the wall. You know, back then they weren't going to rebuild the whole set or they didn't have ways to like pull it apart and do it again. It was like, cool, we're going to get it. It's going to happen. And we're going to blow this whole thing. We're going to shoot Tony Montana 46 times and he's going to have all these quibs and explosions of blood and packets everywhere. <laughs> and it was just absurd. It was ridiculous. Um, I mean, let's assume that the budget is at the highest point where they say it's somewhere between this number and this number. 37 million, let's assume that's the highest possible budget that they had. It still profited and it made $66 million in the box office, which is a lot back then. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, it's definitely a hit. It definitely went on to spawn, you know, spinoffs and inspired other things. It, there's comic books for it. Um, it's a cult classic. Yeah, it, I mean, it really, it really is everyone. You know, even if you haven't seen Scarface, you know the iconic lines, you know, you know, you know that poster, the black and white poster, you just know. That's how ingrained into pop culture that it is at this point. Yeah. Um, it was nominated for Golden Globes, Motion Picture Sound Editing Awards, Golden Raspberry Awards, and a Satellite Award all around. No wins, but all nominations. Mm. Um, uh, okay. It should be noted that... That's why they thanked Howard Hawks at the end of the film. And Ben Hecht. Yes. Wow. So this is a Scarface in 1983. This is something I did not know. It is a remake of the 1932 film Scarface. Had no idea. And I'm reading this, I'm discovering this because it's the only remake to appear on the same AFI top 10 list as the original film because it's 1932 Scarface is number six on the list and 1983 Scarface is number 10 which is kind of wild I had no idea this was a remake in any way shape or form no I no idea absolutely none I thought that was an original I mean obviously because it has so much to do with like the Cuban conflict and Cuban refugees and and on you know cocaine and all of that stuff it, it's a very loose remake yeah I think they took the original. story and said how do we make this work for the 80s because the original movie is called Scarface the shame of the nation and it's a gangster film by Howard Hawks and Howard Hughes Howard, Howard Hughes Howard Hughes and Howard Hawks there's two of those. That's not confusing at all. Uh, Howard Hawks was the director and producer, and then Howard Hughes was the screenwriter and producer. Very interesting. Yeah. That's wow. crazy. I had no idea. You learn something new every day. You, you think that Al Pacino is the first Scarface, and you're like, nah. I'm curious if in 1932 there was a guy with a tiger snorting cocaine. <laughs> I mean, I don't. Highly doubt. Um, maybe just maybe we were talking to Giuseppe about the wrong movie. Maybe he was talking about 1932. Uh, maybe I want to watch Scarface from 1932. Honestly, if anybody ever comes on this podcast and suggests a movie that is older than World War II, I'm just going to be like, I don't know, man. I don't think I can do it. Come on. Expand your horizons. <laughs> you can do it. There's literally 40 billion movies that we could watch that aren't from 1930-something. So? That's the foundation of 
film is from that time. You should be watching them. Don't just stretch. <laughs> stretch. You should be watching classic films. They are the foundation of where we're at today. Just like you said, Scarface influenced films for years to come. So did those films. That's true. That is true. Not the person, not the person that emails you if you want to come on the podcast. But Jim tries to talk any future day player out of an old film, you contact me and I will talk to him. <laughs> I do that. I'm not going to tell people, hey, you can't pick that. I did that once, though, already. I honestly did uh, for Phil because he chose, what uh, was it? Yeah, no, oh, I forget. But I, it was, yeah, it was an older film. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, he, he chose something from like 1920 something. And I was like, no, please pick something else. And then he picked Rocky. And I was like, thank you. Because I can talk about Rocky. I cannot talk about this movie for the first podcast. But I think it is something that we should consider watching an older movie. If somebody suggests it, we'll watch it. It's going to happen. Um, might not love it, Yay. but <laughs> I'll tell the truth. Uh, yeah, but there's no, there's no guarantee we're going to like any film that people suggest. And I mean, I, I did have uh, my issues with Scarface as it yeah. was. So um, the 1980s were pretty wild. And I think Scarface is like the epitome of the 1980s movie scene in terms of like how ridiculous it could get. And I think uh, it, it's, it's something too that is referenced in comedies because of how, how kind of crazy the events of the movie are, like having a tiger. They didn't do that again until like Hangover. And those movies where Mike Tyson had a tiger and it was like laughable, it was hysterical. And I think one of the funniest things that I realized was Scarface was uh, South Park did a whole spoof on Scarface. So in, in the South Park show, KFC became illegal, Kentucky Fried Chicken. So Cartman starts trading KFC buckets and like pieces of chicken as if it was cocaine. And he goes to meet with the Colonel, just like how Tony Montana went to wherever he went to meet with that guy, the higher up uh, met with him and the guy was like, don't ever fuck me. That happened. The Colonel does that to Cartman in South Park. And I never realized it. And then there's a scene later on where Cartman's on the phone with him. He's like, oh, we had a little problem. Yeah. And he's like munching on chicken <laughs> and instead of doing cocaine. But it's just <laughs> such a spoofable thing because of how ridiculous all these 80s things that happened would never happen today. Um, it's, it's so over the top. But, I mean, but you can tell, you know, people just love it. People are obsessed with it. They quote it. They sing about it. They rap about it. They, you know, they make spoofs of it. They take pieces of it and, you know, they put it in their own films. You know, it's definitely a, a cult classic. Yeah. <laughs> my, my first question was going to be because I, I had never watched it as an adult where I could like appreciate it. Uh, now that I have my first question going into it was, where did he get his scar from? And I, I thought there was going to be some big event that like an explosion happens and he gets his scar and then he becomes the Scarface guy and everybody knows of him. It was like, nah, it happened to him when he was a kid. Some, or I think that's what well, he said. That's what he said. You don't know if that's actually the real story. Yeah, so you don't really know that too. Are, but yeah. it's probably some dude cut him with a knife or something. You know, who really knows? You don't know. He was in communist jail for a long time. Yep. But, you know, I think something else that it comes up in a lot of films, you know, is that whole, the whole machismo thing about, like, he literally... Most of his problems just came from the fact that he got, he had a bruised ego. Someone suggested that he wasn't as smart or as manly or as tough or whatever. And he would flip out. Ridiculous. And I, th I think that's also, like I've seen pieces of that in people throughout, you know, my life that I've met, but I, I've never met someone who was that insecure I guess is is deep down he's insecure about who he is and, and his place in the world and what it means to like be a man and all that stuff and 
just to watch him fly off the handle. What an emotional like, what, like it, every two seconds. I'm like, how much, like, obviously all of this stuff is just to prove that you are worth something, you know, you're trying to prove it to yourself. I think uh, one of the first movies where th there was movies in the past where the person is like rising up in the crime world and becomes the most dangerous criminal. But we, I don't think we had seen a character that got it all and then said still he wanted more and he wouldn't stop. And it was just like, dude, if you yeah. just stop and enjoy what you have, you'd be good. And Manny kept saying it like, why aren't you good? Like, what is this not enough? What do you want? And he just kept wanting more. Yeah, at one point he said, I want everything or something like that. And it was just yeah. like, dude, chill, <laughs> breathe a little. But that's not what cocaine's all about. No. Because <laughs> clearly we know. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, but I mean, hey, if you got a pet tiger strapped to the bridge in your backyard, because it was strapped to a bridge in his backyard. Yeah. You mind that there's a bridge in this man's backyard. That's a thing he needed to get around. Yep. Insane. Uh, yeah, I, I, I liked the movie. It was great. I definitely saw some issues with it that I think modern day filmmaking have kind of solved throughout the years, the storytelling issues, and I, especially all the casting and stuff, not casting people of the right ethnicity and things like that. Um, but all in all, you cannot deny that it's a cult classic. It is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you have to you have to watch these movies with a grain of salt. You know, you can't you can't cancel them out and pretend that they don't exist. Um, but you know, you have to understand they are from a different time, so there are going to be things about them that we see more clearly now that we didn't back then. Um, but you know it. As soon as I heard Scarface, I was like, okay, yeah. let's do it. <laughs> We're going to do that, huh? We're going to get into that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <gasps> oh, man. I'm really, I'm loving the, the scope of movies that we've, we've watched on this podcast so far. Oh, yeah. We, we've gone from a lot of gangster films. People love gangsters. I don't yeah. notice that. Is that that's everybody's go-to is like Godfather, Goodfellas, Scarface, Bronx Tale. Like we we've done all those movies already. And it's kind of like, what is what is your obsession with bad people? You know? Uh I think that's something to bring up in, in the future of like podcasts while we're talking about. But it's the idea that we are obsessed with people that do bad things. We, we love all love the anti-hero. We yeah. love the anti-hero. Too. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. Be... And that, that's why, like, those, like, TV shows, like, Breaking Bad, Walter White, not a good guy. I love him. Not a good guy. When House of Cards, before Kevin Spacey, all that Kevin Spacey crap came out, and I was obsessed with that show, loved watching Frank Underwood. Like, it was just fascinating to watch. He loved watching the anti-hero. But then, you know... Kevin Spacey existing, and then <laughs> Kevin Spacey hero? No, maybe not. Uh, no, no, no hero, no nothing. You're gonna he fight should just go. Joel from The Last of Us, bad person. He's a bad person. Right, right. But you love him. You love him. But he's a bad person. Killed hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just I was about to drop some spoilers, but I stopped myself. Yeah, no, don't say anything. People are still playing that game. Yeah. People but I mean, you know, that, that it seems to be a running theme through a lot of, a lot of these. Not, and, you know, I don't know if it's all just big, big gangster films um, that have that, but I don't know. We have, we have a slight obsession, I'm seeing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even the movies, too, like, like superhero movies, we love seeing the flaws in the heroes. That's the most interesting thing. It's the biggest problem with Superman is that he's perfect. He's yeah. the Superman. Uh, so having this character who's ideally, like you kind of like see him as a perfect human being and you know, it's just like, there's nothing wrong with him. There's no conflict. So it's hard to watch. When you have a character like Batman who has all these aggressive tendencies and beats the shit out of people and he's this really interesting detective and you know, 
his character, I think, has much more flaws and interesting parts, and all his villains are really interesting. Whereas Superman is like, he's too perfect. Yeah. Especially all the Marvel movies too. They did a really good job of like making these characters feel really unique and really mm -hmm. like human beings. Uh, so Tony Stark is the most narcissistic prick you could imagine, but he's Tony Stark and he's saving the world and he's doing all these incredible things. Um, even Captain America has got some flaws. He's supposed to be like the image of perfection in the Marvel universe. Yeah. I've got nothing to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> not, a, not as big of a superhero nerd as I am, but I mean, I, characters in any movies, we love rooting for people that have flaws and can overcome them. Yeah, yeah. Um, although, I think that definitely takes on a different, uh, different color, I guess, when you're rooting for the bad guy. <laughs> Yeah. Because they're still, they're the hero, they're obviously, they're the hero of the story that we're watching, but they're not a good person, but we still enjoy watching them win. Story. That's the way that you have to see villains. Um, that's why I think when The Dark Knight came out, the Joker was such a unique perspective because he wasn't doing it because he's the hero of his own story. He just wanted to be chaotic and crazy. Yeah. And it was so new for people. Um but now we're delving into more superhero movies. I feel like someone, there just has to be one person out there that's coming on this podcast that's going to be like, watch Avengers. And I'll I mean, talk about it all. We had, we had that opportunity with Brandon, uh, Brandon Ford Green when we had him on, but we, he suggested like 50 movies. Not yeah. just, yeah. That, so I wanted to pick one that we hadn't seen. So right. we went with something. Different. We went with Rachel getting married on that one, well, but maybe, anybody maybe someday soon. Superhero movie, bring it on. <laughs> maybe someday soon, someone will suggest a superhero movie, and it'll make Jim's day. <laughs> yep, it will. <laughs> That's just a plea to any uh, future day players we have on. <laughs> uh, well, guys, that's a good place to leave it off as any. Uh, thank you guys all for tuning in to the AFC podcast. We appreciate you guys watching on YouTube. However, you can also listen on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or CastBox. Uh, thank you again to Giuseppe Bosilio for joining us, talking about his Broadway career, Ode to Passion, which is out now. You can go onto Amazon Prime. We're going to include the link so you guys can watch it. Go check it out. Watch that movie. It's also a movie I worked on, so I care about it quite a bit. And... Thank you guys for watching. I'm Jim Galizia. And I'm Victoria Fragnito. We'll see you guys next time.